Richard Kaiser here with SYNC, Director of Demand Engine and Sales Ops, and we are very excited to have our good friend, Verl Workman, here today. How are you doing, Verl? I'm doing great, man. I'm excited to be here. This is a great leadership uh, session that we're going to do today, and I think you're going to be glad you're on video and you're interactive with us. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of you pop on video here in a sec. And so while people are kind of funneling here in, into the room, I think the background for this a little bit, Verl, one of the things we had been hearing a lot from our clients is, is the housing market has kind of changed in certain aspects, the buying cycle and, and the selling cycle for, for buyers and sellers has gotten a little more complex, a little more high, higher touch. And there's certain things we deal with a lot of real estate teams and even single agents that are, that have had a lot of success. And a lot of that comes from just them as the team leader, them as the agent doing it themselves and as they're getting asked to do more right now, one of the common themes we just keep hearing is, I don't have unlimited time in the world to manage the website, to manage the marketing, the technology. I often don't have time to make all the calls that I need to make, or the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh, and eighth call on a prospect, all the back office things. And that's a theme we keep hearing over and over again. I know your team spends a lot of time working with people on that. And so when, when you mentioned delegate like a pro is the topic here, we thought it really connected in with what we're hearing uh, from a lot of our clients right now. Yeah, it's true. I think that uh, when things get tough, leaders have a tendency to fall back into their role of salesperson. And in the absence of leadership, you see people making big decisions to move and leave. And so leadership and the way that we work as leaders makes such an impact on not just what's going on in the industry, but what's happening individually with our offices and our teams. A lead follow-up is one of the many, many things a leader has to be focused on, but who does the task is the ability to delegate and to let things go. And that's one of the biggest challenges that leaders have. I'm going to do a lot of content today and we're going to do it in a short amount of time. So I encourage you to be, to be able to ask questions and jump in and pause me when I get, when I get rolling here. Yeah, let's go ahead and, I mean, let's go ahead and get into it. So yeah, delegate like a pro. It's, it's the thing we're hearing right now. I don't have enough time my day. I need help. How do I ask for help? We're bringing you in, Verl. Help the people out. All right. So let me just tell you a little bit about, for those of you who know who I am, I'm Verl Workman from Salt Lake City, Utah. And we have a company called Workman Success Systems that specializes in building a very high producing seven-figure real estate teams. And so most of our clients come to us are, are making one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, and they want to go to five hundred. They're at five hundred. They want to go to a million or a million. They want to go to from a million gross to a million net. And we've created systems and processes to make greatness predictable. And with all, with almost a hundred coaches today, and a very very specific process and methodology of building teams. That's what we focus on. And so. If you're a team leader, you're running a team, you want to build a team or lead a team, that's what we do. And this specific, and you know, one of the things that has been consistent with Workman is as we grow teams, as you grow teams, we always lead with revenue, not expense. But there becomes a time in a team when we start looking at how do we generate more leads? What's our role as a team leader to create opportunities for the people that we serve? And Sync has just become one of our key partners in consistent, not just lead flow, but quality lead flow and quality conversion tools and resources. And so we appreciate Sync as a partner and many, many of our teams use Sync as a, as a, as a critical resource or managing the most important uh, thing they have in their business. And those are the relationships that we gain while we're in, while we're in real estate. And so thank you for having me and thanks for being uh, a part of our, our workman family. I'm going to share my screen with you and Matt's not with us today, but that's okay. We still look good. All right. So let's talk about the real problem. So the problem is we're good at sales. And we are out there selling houses and we get busy and all of a sudden we get to this place where something's got to give, like we're spending time away from our families and the people we care about and we have more clients coming in than we can handle. And so we decide we're going to hire someone, whether it's a buying a, a buyer's agent or a showing assistant or even an administrative assistant or client care coordinator. And so because we're good at sales, we think, well, that'll be easy. I'll just hire someone to help me and they'll do what I do. And then we hire someone and they don't do what you do and they don't think like you think and they haven't had your life experiences. And so you screw them up by putting them into a role where they don't have the opportunity to succeed. How many of you have ever hired someone and know that you let them down as a leader because you didn't train them and develop them and take all the things that were in your head and your heart and 
give them to them to be successful. And if, if you don't raise your hand on this, then you haven't really hired many people because I certainly have done that. And it's through our failure as leaders where we learn to develop. If I hadn't had any problems or I have never screwed it up, then I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as effective as we are today at hiring and developing people. It's through our experiences that allow us to get better. And so we know what our team should do. We like, we, we see it clearly in our minds. Does anybody else get frustrated when like, it's so clear to you what the solution is to a problem and you've got someone that you've trained and shared with, and then they go to solve it. And you're like, where did that come from? Like, did you not listen to anything that I was saying? Is it like, is this resonate with anybody? And you're like, I, I know we were all in the same meeting. I know that I trained you. And then a, a scenario comes up and they do something and you're like, what? That, that is, it's not how we do it. Well, we know that they have a desire to be successful and they want to please us, but they're not doing what we thought they should be doing. And we always blame it on, I don't, you know, we blame it on, we don't understand why they don't see it the way we do or why they weren't listening. And the reality is, is that we need to get the mirror out. We need to look in the mirror and we need to decide that the reason people don't succeed or the reason they don't perform at the level we want them to is because we as leaders haven't effectively communicated to them what it is we want done. Even if you think you have, if it's not being the one done the way you, you want it, then you still have to think about what, what can I do differently to communicate it in a way that they'll receive it, adopt it, and be able to move it forward. And this is not easy. So as I talk about this, I just want you to know, as we talk about leadership, nothing that I give you is, they're simple concepts, but the adoption of a simple concept into actually doing something is very different than thinking about it. Okay, so now let's talk about what poor leadership, what happens when you have poor leadership. So when we have a lack of good leadership, what happens is we have breakdowns in communication. When you have a breakdown in communication, the first thing that goes is your people. So we have the inability to retain team members. We see high turnover. The second thing that happens is the very reason that we hired team members, because we can't uh, communicate effectively to help them be successful in the role that we've hired them for, we end up doing it ourselves anyway, or it causes us so much extra time because we're constantly overlooking and overdoing the things that we delegated out. So we end up working more, even though we've hired someone to give us our life back. And then it makes it so at some point we have the inability to leave production. Does anybody here at some point want to be able to continue to make money in real estate without having to list and sell houses? Anybody want anybody want that? Like, would you like to have money coming in without you working? I can tell you that when we go from a million gross to a million net, you'll be doing less work than you are today at whatever level you are. And so when I take you to 3 million in gross closed commission, you'll have a choice of whether or not to list and sell houses because the business won't be dependent on you selling houses. But you have to stop thinking like a realtor and start thinking like the CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation. Because as a CEO of a million dollar corporation, you make decisions differently. And so when poor, when you have poor leadership, you can't leave production and you have the inability to delegate thinking other people are incompetent, which they're just not. People are competent. They just need to be trained. And then you have this high level of stress and anxiety that happens on an ongoing basis. And we're going to talk about how do we solve that. So one of the first things that I'll tell you is, is that as entrepreneurs, we're constantly thinking and changing the way we do things. And we're always chasing new, new opportunities and new marketing ideas and new ways to generate leads. We're chasing all these different things. We're, and then we set up meetings with our teams and we do them in an inconsistent way. And so entrepreneurs, I found, are pretty bad at holding meetings. And so we've put together what we call a daily huddle agenda. And I'll give you all a copy of this later. I'll just give you a QR code. And there's some things I'm going to give you as downloads. And so one of the things as a leader is you have to have consistency in your meetings. Consistency in meetings that have value, give your people the opportunity to talk about what their cha challenges are, their impediments are, and then you have the ability to give them training and education and communication so they can move things forward. But you have to be consistent with the meetings. We have a thing called the Daily Success Habits Tracker. And if you've heard me on other webinars, we've given it away, we've talked about it. But the Daily Success Habits Tracker is the thing we do that we know if you get 61 points a day doing dollar productive activities, that it takes between 230 and 260 points to have a closing. We know that greatness is predictable if you focus on the right activities that are dollar productive. And so every day we teach our leaders to do a daily huddle. We review their daily success habits. We identify where the gaps are, and then we coach or train to the gaps. 
I have team leaders that'll say to me, I'll ask them when things aren't going the way they want them to go, I'll say, okay, well, tell me about your daily huddles. And they go, okay. I go, how often do you have them? They go, well, once a week. I'm like, okay, so what's it called? It's called the daily huddle and you're holding it once a week. Where do you think the problem is? It's not daily, right? I saw Rena smile at that. <laughs> She's like, I got that. So if you're not holding your daily huddles daily, you're only doing it two days a week or Mondays and Fridays, you're missing the point of the daily huddle. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So every day, if you know at nine o'clock, we're going to have a daily huddle and you've got to come to the office dressed for success, meaning you get up and you shower and you put your clothes on and you're, you're dressed like you're going to meet with clients. What happens to your physiology is you behave differently at work. So when you get dressed for success, you just know that you're going to be seeing people. You do activities that will get you in front of people. But when you get up and you grab your coffee and you dress for success from the waist up so they can't see it on Zoom and you have your pajamas on or your shorts on and your flip flops, what happens is, is you work differently. You're not as aggressive in your follow up. You don't try and set appointments for an hour from now. You don't do the activities that create results. And so even if you're team members are virtual, I'm going to encourage you to make sure they have their cameras on and that they're dressed for success in your daily huddle. You got to be consistent with your meetings and they have to be valuable and they have to be short. When we do daily huddles, they're 15 minutes. It's a huddle. It's not a meeting. It's a daily huddle. And so I'm going to encourage you to do that. And then don't change. You hold them. I don't care if you're on vacation, you hold your daily huddle. And great, what great leaders do is they teach their team members how to hold the huddle when they're not there. The team leaders are responsible for accountability, not the team leader. It's the team members. So think about that with your daily meetings. All right. One of my favorite books is written by Patrick Lencioni. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Have any of you ever read this book or have access to this book? LJ, have you read that one? Thumbs up. Yeah. And Patrick Lencioni is the five dysfunction. And I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of people have it, but they haven't really studied it. They've got, gotten deep into the five dysfunctions. I'm going to share with you a quiz and some of the things and the resources that Patrick makes available to everybody. His follow-up book to this is called The Ideal Team Player. And he teaches how to hire hungry, humble, and smart people that help you eliminate the dysfunctions. And so it's a great, uh, great resource for you. In the five dysfunctions, I'm going to talk about each of the dysfunctions and kind of how we how we deal with it. The, the first dysfunction is the absence of trust. When a friend of mine wrote a book called The Trusted Leader, his name is David Horsager. And David Horsager in the book, The Trusted Leader, talks about any business issue, any business culture, any family problem always goes back to the absence of trust in a relationship. When you have a problem in a relationship, whether it's their team members, broker owners, agents, family members, spouses, partners, whatever that means to you, trust or lack of trust is the number one reason they fail. And so does your team trust you? Isn't that a great question? You can ask yourself that. Does my team trust me? And do we trust them to do what needs to be done? If the team doesn't trust you. So how do you build trust? Number one is we start by having a set of core values. We hire and fire to our core values. I'll tell you that any new employee that joins Workman, you can see them on my desk, gets a copy of our core values. Choose to be happy, communicate openly and honestly, have and share vision, live freely. We persist until we succeed. Integrity always. We show gratitude, not just have gratitude. And we live freely. And each one of those core values is reviewed in every one of our Monday meetings. And uh, an employee gets to take a core value, talk about how they apply it, what it means to them, and how it matters. When you start bringing your core values into the thing, into your meetings and into your interactions, what happens is it begins to build trust. When they see that your core values are who you are instead of something you put on the wall for clients to see so they'll hire you, it's a very different interaction on values. We could do a, and this is something maybe for an upcoming webinar, we can do a, a, a webinar just on core values, and I'll show you how to deal with any problem or any challenge with your team going back to your core values. And we can bring all your big team challenges, and I'll show you, you bring up your core values, and we'll deal with them. So use your core values and use them for everything. I'll give you an example. So, you know, many of your sync users, when an agent doesn't follow up with leads, how many of you have that as a frustration? We have all these leads, but we don't follow up. Rena. Okay. So let's look at my, let's look at my core values. Okay. When you came to work here, you told me that you would follow up with leads and we have a system we follow called the ABCs of lead conversion. And you said you'd follow, but then you're not following up. So are you lying to me now? Or were you lying to me then? Where's the integrity when you say you're going to do something and you don't actually do it? Do we have a lack of integrity or did you forget what to do? 
Another one is communicate openly and honestly. So here's a core value. The problem is agents aren't following up with leads, but we agreed that as a team, we're going to communicate openly and honestly. But if you're not communicating openly and honestly with a consumer, how do you convert the opportunities that are there? You see how that's a core value issue, not a person issue. Here's another one. We persist until we succeed. That's my motto. We follow up until they buy or tell us to die. I want to, I want you to follow up with clients until they file a restraining order. Like that's how the kind of follow up we do. That's why we convert such a high number of sync leads is because we have persist until we succeed as a core value. And so it's like, if there are no bad leads, there are only people who aren't ready yet. We're just going to stay at the front of their mind until they convert. So I want you to think about your core values. Choose to be happy. How does it make you feel? When I review your lead follow-up and you're not doing it, does that make you happy? So by choosing not to do it, you're choosing not to be happy. I can go through with every one of my core values and we can choose a core value that's in violation when someone doesn't do what they say they're going to do. So core values are critical to your culture if you understand how to weave them into your conversations. Trust is developed through training and education. I'll tell you that we, when we at Workman build training programs, we don't build training programs to teach people how not to get sued. I don't build a training program so it gets approved for continuing education. I build training programs to teach people how to be freaking amazing at being a buyer's agent, a listing partner, an administrative assistant, because team leaders don't take their foot off the gas long enough to develop people. So we have a buyer agent training called BAM, listing agent training called SLAM, an admin training called AMP. And then we have a new agent training called RAMP. And they're all designed to lead with revenue. And so it's teaching your people how to sell, which is a kind of a missing skill set in our marketplace. Matter of fact, most agents, and LJ, you think about this, how long you've been doing, how long you've been in this business? More than 10 years? Five? Two years. All right. So, and if you've been in this business less than 12 years, you don't even know what it's like to be in a balanced market. You've been in an anomaly of a market where it's been easy to be real estate. All you got to do is show up. And now all of a sudden, the market has become balanced again. It's not a buyer's or a seller's market. There's still hundreds of thousands of houses being sold, but it's not easy anymore. And so we have to be excellent. And so we've gone from being in a activity-based market to being in a skills-based market. And so the agents that have the skills are going to perform at a higher level than those who don't. And there's this training gap of 10 years where they didn't need to have the skills to be to make a lot of money. Now we have to do skills development. So I would say that if you were looking for something to do with to to be to elevate your game, to be able to sell more is to get engaged with a company that focuses on a high level of skills development. And then you got to run the system. You don't have to figure this out yourself. Greatness is predictable. We find people who are doing great things and we copy them. And as a leader, you got to allow people to, you have to allow people to fail. The reason Workman's system is so good, and do you want me to let, let you in on a little secret? It's because we have one. You see, most people don't have a system to follow. And it's not that mine's better than yours. It's that you haven't taken everything you do three times and created a system for it. We have. And so when I plug you into a system, methodically, you'll have a better result than when you're trying to figure it out as you go. Does that make sense? And so systems for everything. The next thing is people don't know what to say and they don't know how to say things correctly. And so we role play every day. I call it building a culture of productivity. Every agent, every team, every office, and every family has a culture. And that culture is either intentionally created or it's accidentally created. And you fortunately get to choose what you want your culture to be. Do you want your culture to be a place where mediocrity is allowed, where people can come and go as they please because we want to have happy people? Or do you have a culture where people are making money and taking care of their families and we have each other's back? I want a culture of production. If you want to be a license hanger, go hang your license somewhere else. But if you want to make some money and you want to change the way your family is able to operate because you have a financial wherewithal to do whatever you want, then this is a good place for you. But every day we're going to practice what we say. We come in for a daily huddle, we role play for 30 minutes, and then we prospect as a team for a minimum of an hour. That's a rhythm of success that a, high, that a well-coached team is going to do. Okay, number Bro, two. Question for you, right? You were talking earlier about the chat selling in this market versus one more than 12 years ago. I think one of the things we've seen on our end, or something we've heard from different team leaders out there is they brought on an agent, right? Maybe it's somebody who's been in the business for two or three years and they joined the team there and they had an experience two or three years ago that was X. They were working at, you know, Y level of hardness 
yep. and they're still working at that same level and they're objection handling that same way yet their production might have gone down 20 or 30 percent and so we're now you know i guess from a motivation standpoint do you have any advice for people on how to reset expectations there of like as the market changes well, first of all, what you say, what you're saying to your customers today has to be very different than what you said to them a couple of years ago. And so we wrote, we wrote a program called Shift. And every couple of weeks, we come out with new modules on what to say to the consumer to get them off the sideline and get re-engaged. But I will tell you this, that, you know, two years ago, it took 160 calls to get an appointment. Today, it takes 260. You can't do the same amount of work you did two years ago to get the same result. It takes 100 more calls. So you have to have more activity to get the same result. You have to work harder. You can't you can't just do the same thing and wonder why it's not working. You got to go and roll up your sleeves. You got to make a bigger effort. And it's just a game and you just have to know your numbers. Once you understand your numbers, you do what it takes to duplicate those numbers to get that predictable result. You'll hear me say it over and over and over and over again that success is predictable. It's just what I predict today is that based on the data, it requires more effort for the same result. So if you're used to selling five houses a month, you can't do it doing the things you were doing a year ago or even two years ago or even six months ago. It's just different today. But you can still do five a month. We just have to do it differently. We have to say things differently. So that's a good, it's a great question. The second dysfunction, if I can go into it, is the fear of conflict. And, you know, people think of conflict as a bad thing. I will tell you that conflict is a great thing if you understand this. We don't have people problems. We have process problems. And so if your people are not performing at a level you want them to, ask yourself, where did the process fail us? Did we not have a process? Did we not write it down? Did we not communicate effectively? It's a process problem. If you start from the default position as a leader that I've hired someone that wants to succeed, but then you constantly attack them for not doing the right thing instead of attacking the process that created the conflict, you're missing out on what it really means to be a good leader. And so create a safe place where people can attack process, get feedback and give feedback without making it a personal attack. Make your, don't, there's no reason to make someone feel incompetent or less than because um, you weren't willing to give them time to help them understand it. And you'll find that over time, you'll start to work out a rhythm of communication that works for everybody so that you know to give them the time they need to be able to, to, to be able to do well in their job. And so are you able to address the problems head on and, or do they continue to be unchecked? If you use the avoidance method of leadership, there's a problem, therefore I'm going to avoid it, then the problem intensifies and gets worse over time. Number three is lack of commitment. This is such a huge one. And it's not a lack of commitment the way you think it is. Lack of commitment is when team members don't engage in open productive conflict. They might hesitate to fully get into the team games. The team is going to do a retreat and they don't go. I also recognize lack of commitment as a lack of commitment to your family. Because if you're leaving your family and going to work, but you're not doing activities that give them any income, what are you really saying to your family? Fake work is not a um, thing. You've got to do real activities that generate real revenue. And so engage. So how do you recognize it? And then, you know, we've done a lot of work with, with uh, people that have been on SEAL teams. As a matter of fact, at our conference coming up in Florida in October, I have the gentleman who just recently retired as the commander of the most elite SEAL team of all time. And in the last 20 years, this this gentleman as a commander has been on things like Osama bin Laden, Captain Phillips, the all the things you hear about, weapons of mass destruction coming over on ships. And we talk about uh, what it means to be fully committed to a team, talk to the SEAL teams, and they'll tell you they would never show up and not be mentally and physically in a condition because they don't want to let their team members down. And it's not because they make them do more push-ups. It's not because they make them run faster. It's because they would never show up in a condition that would put their other team members at risk. Are you as a team leader and are your team members fully committed to making sure they would never let the team down by not doing the right thing, by not being educated and providing great services to the client, by not following up with a lead? And so that's a great way to recognize the commitment is, are they committed to themselves, to the family, and are they committed to the team? And if they are, they don't have to say it because you can see it in everything that they do. Number four is avoidance of accountability. This is probably one of the biggest things that we don't want to do as team leaders. We avoid holding people accountable. And more importantly, we, hold, we avoid holding ourselves accountable. 
you know, I know that I don't know Rena, but I, I guarantee when she gets up every day, she does whatever she needs to do to make money. She's going to go out there and figure it out. Is fa- Rena, you can just nod your head. Is failure an option for you? No. When failure is not an option, you work differently, don't you? Like, I'm not failing. Like, my family's got to eat. I'm not going to let them down. And so you don't need somebody telling you what to do. And so accountability is not me telling Rena what to do. It's Rena choosing to do the right thing accountability is a choice you make. It's not something someone does to you. And Rena, you can also answer this question. Is there any way I can get you to do stuff you don't want to do if you're committed to not doing it? No, you're not going to, I can't make you do something you don't want to do. Accountability is a bunch of crap. We think we want to hold our agents accountable, but you're not going to do it if you don't want to do it. So we have to create a culture where they choose it. Accountability is a choice you make. It's not something someone does to you. Accountability is like you decide that you're going to accept personal responsibility for your own actions. And accountability partners help you keep the promises you make to yourself. They're not there to beat you over the head. When as a team leader, you realize that accountability isn't beating your people up, but it's just creating an open conversation where they can tell you whether or not they're keeping the commitments they made to themselves. And you're there to help remind them of why those commitments were important. It changes the culture on your team. Accountability is love. It's not pain. It's when I care about someone so much that I know if they continue that behavior is going to be harmful to their family. So I'm unwilling to not ask them if they're, if, if that's still important to them, that's when, you know, I care about you as a leader. So write it down. Accountability equals what love. It's not something you do to someone. It's a choice that you make. Okay. Number five is inattention to results. The ultimate dysfunction occurs when we, our team members, They prioritize their individual needs over the goals of that of the brokerage or of the team. And so they want to make sure they get results personally, but they don't focus on tracking the right thing of their team. How many of you can tell me how many dials it takes to have a conversation, how many conversations it takes to have an appointment, how many appointments it takes to get a buyer or seller, a contract signed, and how many contracts is assigned to get a closing? Is there anybody here that can tell me those numbers? I'm looking for you to raise your hand or go in the chat. Okay, if I were to ask you what the number one most important thing it is you track in your business, what would you say that it is? And please go in, I want you to go in the chat and I want you to answer that. What is the number one most important thing that you track on a daily basis in your business? What is, if you have enough of this, everything else is okay. Samantha says appointments. Sarah says appointments. Chris says appointments. Anybody else? Is it dials? There we go. Number of calls. Phone calls, phone calls, appointments, calls, money-making activities. There you go, Jamie. She's listening in class today. Okay, so the answer is it's the number of face-to-face appointments. If you know you need two appointments a week in order to sell four houses a month, you'll make the number of calls necessary to get the two appointments a week. If you focus on the number of face-to-face appointments that it takes to get to your goal, everything else takes care of itself because you'll do those activities to hit that number of appointments. So I'm going to tell you that you can make lots of contacts and calls, but not set appointments. You'll never make any money. You only make money when you're face-to-face with a buyer or seller. We make this as a contact sport. And so whether you're prospecting, following up with sync leads, whether you're knocking doors, doing open houses, working FISBOs, expireds, I don't care what your pillars are. The goal of every conversation is to set an appointment. And so we focus on scripts and dialogues and value and things that we give the consumer so that when you have a conversation with him, they go, oh, I want that. How do I meet with you to get it? That's the interaction we want. So not tracking the right things and then not focusing on the right things. And then the second most important thing that you track in your business is net profit. Everybody likes to talk about what your gross commission is or how many units you sold or your GCI or you platinum diamond or gold or whatever. But like the only number that matters is how much money did you keep? And no one talks about that. That's another topic for a webinar. We can do financial awareness as teams. We have we can do we have a lot of work to do here, but we could spend a whole hour just on financial benchmarking and where to put money and how much goes in marketing, education, training, coaching. How much do you put in all those categories so you know at the end of the year you can be profitable? What do you think about that? 
Bro, that'd be good. That's actually one of our topics around ROI is the yeah. latest fixed and variable cost. I, I think there's something there. So not just ROI, but ROT. And that stands for return on time. If you if you do an if you spend an hour doing something, what is the return on the time that you're getting by spending an hour doing it? Most of us spend, I'd say 70 or 80% of our day doing things that give you zero return on time. You know where you get return on time? Face to face with buyers and sellers. Your job as a leader is to do two things: business development, create opportunities, and people development. That's it. Everything else is fake work. Get it off your list. All right. So how would you like to know how you're doing as a team? How are you really doing? So are you trying to become leaders? I found that if you're not just trying to become better leaders, if you focus on becoming a better person, it affects how you lead in every area of your life. So as a human, are you doing things that will make you a better father, a better mother, a better grandfather, a better partner, a better, a better son, or a better daughter? When you think about what matters to you in your life, those personal relationships, how much time do you spend really thinking about who I am as a person and how do I show up better for the people I care about? Because I found that when you work on yourself as an individual, it has massive effects on you as a leader in your business. Because as you become a better person, you become a better leader. A lot of people read books on leadership, and I think they need to be, read books on how to become a better person. How do you become a better person? How do you think about the world a little bit differently? We're going to talk more about that. I want you to consider this principle. This is from a book I read like, well, more than 20 years ago called The Oz Principle. And The Oz Principle is a book written by a couple of consultants out of Brigham Young University. And they talk about this results pyramid. And here's how it works. It works like this. The experiences that we've had in our life up until today form our beliefs. And so your beliefs, what you believe in, is not somebody else's job to tell you whether they're right or wrong because they're based on your experiences. They're your beliefs. You own them. It's not, I can't tell you have bad beliefs. I can just tell you that you have experiences that formed them. And I understand your beliefs because of your experiences. And what we believe is possible controls what we focus on and what our actions are. And that gives us the results that we want. Let me give you an example of this. My first my first real business was I started a, a retail store selling satellites and hot tubs at the state fair. And I remember, yep, I did. We need to smile today. Yep, I sold satellite dishes and hot tubs at the fair. And I got really good at it. I remember the first time we signed up to the state fair, I was probably 23 years old. I rented an inflatable gorilla and put a sign on his chest and it said sale. And people would come to the spot, come to the fair, and we'd walk around, we'd get them to buy hot tubs. And I set a goal to sell 10 hot tubs. I didn't know how many I could sell. I was made about a thousand bucks a hot tub. I figured if I could make 10 grand, it'd be worth the 2,500 bucks I paid for the booth. And so I set a goal to sell 10 hot tubs. And the very last day of the fair, I, I sold my 10th hot tub and I remember going and getting in line at the frozen lemonade stand and buying me and my sales guy some frozen lemonades. And I turned around with my lemonades and the guy who was standing behind me had this slick shirt on. It was collared, long sleeves. And on the pocket, it said, Cal Spas, my competition. And I'm like, hey, what's up? How you guys doing? And the guy says, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I says, he says, how about you? And I said, oh, <laughs> we're doing good. Hit our goal. He says, good for you. Do you mind if I ask what your goal was? I said, I don't want to say. It was 10. We got 10. How about you? And he says, well, that's good. And he said it kind of condescending. And I'm like, what? Well, how many did you guys sell? He said, we sold 100. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then I went away from that conversation asking myself why. And it starts with number one, is they had done a fair before and they knew what they could sell. Number two, and I sent all my brothers and sisters and every, my cousins to everybody to go walk their show and watch what they did. They ran a system in their booth of how they greeted people, how they did a needs probe, how they took them through the hot tubs, when they demonstrated it, when they got, oh, don't ever sit in an empty hot tub at the state fair. That's where they got you. When you sit in the empty hot tub, somebody bring you a drink and a clipboard and then they talk about where it's going to, you know, work out all your aches and pains and then they close. Well, the next year, I borrowed their beliefs of what was possible, and I followed their system, and we sold 70 hot tubs. You see, my experiences formed my belief in what was possible, and that was to sell 10. I didn't have any experiences. But the moment I saw somebody at the same environment doing more, I realized I didn't know what I was doing, so I copied what they did. And I just did the activities of someone who was scoring at a higher level, and it gave me a better result. 
So your experiences are yours and they form the beliefs in what you believe is possible. I'm here to tell you that there is so much more possible, that I am blown away at the greatness in people. The difference between average and exceptional very rarely has to do with the quality of the person, but it has everything to do with the activities or the things they focus on. And so as your coach, what I want to help you do is I want to help you focus on the right things by, co by copying greatness. And then by doing the right activities, you get new results and your beliefs change in what's possible. When I started working with Christy, she was making about 250000 a year. Her goal was to get to 500000 because she didn't think she was ever going to be worth that much. Last year, she did about $3.4 million. And when I talked to her about what changed is that when she went from two fifty dollars to five seventy five dollars in one year, and then from five seventy five dollars to $1.1 million, she started realizing if she did the things that her coach told her to do, she started to get predictable results. And so she took her current beliefs and set them aside and borrowed my beliefs and what was possible for her until she created her own new beliefs. Does that make sense? This beliefs pyramid is game changing when you understand that all you need is some new experiences. So who's open to having some new experiences to change what you believe is possible for yourself? Is anybody open to that? Because being open to those kinds of new experience is what changes your whole life. And so, you know, we send our kids on missions. We, we have them go do service. We want them to do things, to have experiences in life, because we want them to believe that by giving back and making a difference in somebody else's life, they, are, they feel greater reward. Well, we can tell them that, but until they experience it, they don't believe it. And so that's why as parents, we focus on creating great experiences for our children so they can have better blood. But for those of you who don't know, I have six children and I just had my 10th grandchild. And those are the most important th things to me. <laughs> hey, Jamie, <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, so consider the Oz principle. Now let's talk about the five dysfunction of a team. Have, are you guys all open to do a quiz? You want to do a quiz with me and let's see if we have dysfunction in your business? Come on, LJ, you up for it? Joanne's up for it? Okay, everybody grab a sheet of paper and we're going to make a number one to 15. So I want you to just grab a sheet of paper. You're going to make a number one to 15. So you have one that I'm going to give you and I'll give you a question. It'll The answer will either be one, two, or three. And you're going to put the number by each of the questions. And then I'm going to give you a sheet. and It'll tell you where uh, we fit. Okay. And so you all do that. Take a second. And just uh, write your write your numbers one to 15. Let me know when you have that. We got it. Okay. Hey, Sarah, thank you for saying you're ready. Okay. Joanne's got it. Courtney's ready to go. Okay, here we go. Question number one. Number one is, my team members are passionate and unguarded in the discussion of their issues. One is rarely, two is sometimes, three is usually. Are my team members passionate and unguarded in discussion of issues? Will they tell you what the problems are? Number two, will team members call out each other's deficiencies and unproductive behavior, behaviors? Are they good about getting on each other to call out Hey, you didn't do your daily success habits, or you're not doing your follow-ups, or you're not doing your, you know, your 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 lead gen activities, right? Are, are they usually able to call out? Sometimes willing to call out, or rarely call out each other. So number three is, do team members know what their peers are working on and how they contribute to the collective good of the team? This really comes down to so, for example. Does your buyer's agents really know the amount of work it takes your transaction coordinator to do it when they don't turn in paperwork properly? <laughs> they rarely know, sometimes know, or usually really know what their peers are working on and how they contribute to the collective good of the team. Are we really working cohesively as a team? Okay, number four, you ready? Team members, are they quick? And do they genuinely apologize to one another when they say or do something inappropriate or damaging to the team? You know, I lost a client because they didn't follow up fast enough. That's on me. My bad. I'll do better. Usually, sometimes, or rarely. Number five, are team members willing to make sacrifices such as budget or give away their turf or decrease their lead count in order to have everybody on the team have better distribution? Are they willing to make sacrifices in their department or areas of expertise for the good of the team? Will you do something that hurts you for the benefit of the team? Rarely, sometimes, or usually. It's interesting to ask these questions, isn't it? All right, number six, team members. Do they openly admit their mistakes and weaknesses? Are they willing to tell you when they screwed it up? Number seven, are your team members compelling and not boring? 
Are they engaging? You know what I mean by that? Like <laughs> if they're rarely compelling and usually boring, you, you need to say that. Yeah, yeah, they're rarely compelling. Number eight, team members leave meetings confident that their peers are completely committed to the decisions that we all agreed upon, even if there was initial disagreement. So when we disagree how we're going to do a client party and your idea is not accepted, once we then decide as a team, does everybody get on board and do it? Or is there like, you didn't take my idea, so I'm not doing it. Number nine, morale is significantly affected by the failure to be able to achieve team goals. We don't hit our goals. Does everybody's morale go down because someone's beating each other up? Usually, sometimes or rarely. During team meetings, the most important and difficult issues are they put on the table to be resolved. We talk about the hard things. One rarely, three usually, two sometimes. Number 11, team members are deeply concerned about the prospect of letting down their peers. Kind of like I talked with the Navy SEALs, right? Do you genuinely feel like I'm concerned that if I don't do this training or if I don't show up to sync you, I'm going to let down my, my team members or do they just get what's theirs? Number 12, team members know about each other's personal lives and they're comfortable discussing them. Who's having babies? What's happening with their kids' sports? What's a great vacation that a team members going on? All of those things. Are they, are, they, are they comfortable discussing things going on in our personal lives? Okay, three more. And then I'm going to tell you how to score it. Okay, but team members and discussions with clear, specific resolutions and calls to action. When we're done with the discussion, we have a comp. We, what do we do now? What are the next steps? How are we moving it forward? Usually, sometimes, or rarely. Team members challenge one another about their plans and approaches. When you do your business plans, you have team members go, okay, so how are you going to get there? What are, You say this, but have you thought about this? Do we challenge each other uh, in, in an engaging way, sometimes, rarely, or usually? Here's a good one. Team members are slow to seek credit for their own contributions, but quick to point out the credit of others. Are you quick to say somebody else did a great job on that conversion? Or are you quick to be like, yeah, nailed it. I got it. Give me a star. I'm the bomb. Who's your daddy? All those things. Are you quick to give it to somebody else? Or are you quick to take it yourself? All right. So now I'm going to give you this. So you can grab a QR code or you copy and paste this link and drop it into your Google Doc. If you sign into Google, it'll give you the same scoring sheet. But I'm going to show you what it means. So then what you'll do, you can take a picture of it however you want to do this. So on your, on your statements, right? You just write, you can write this out yourself. Do dysfunction one, two, three, four, and five. They each have three questions. Do one, two, and three. So in statement four, in question four, if your answer was a two, put two there. In question six, if your answer was one, put one there. And in, in question 12, if it was a three, put three there. So you'd have two, three, your, your answer would be six. And so I want everybody to go through and just fill this out across the board. And so in, dysf in dysfunction two, statement one, statement seven, and statement 10. And then what was your total? Now, I'm going to ask you some of your totals. We're going to talk about them. By the way, is this interesting to you guys? Is this like something that's interesting as we're going through this, figuring out where our, how our teams are functioning? Do you find value here so far? Renee, give me a nod. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll stay. Okay, good. Once you've gone through all five, uh, somebody just go in the in the notes and just let me know and I'll and we'll go through and we'll talk about it. My my assistant's on here. I wonder if she's doing this so we can figure out where our dysfunction is. Brittany's nodding. Yep, I'm doing it. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll get right on it. You come in, we'll have a conversation about it. I love it. Okay. So LJ, are you done? I saw you writing number. You were taking good notes as we were going, and I saw you answering questions. So let's go, let's total them up. So in your first dysfunction, write your write your scores in the in the chat box. So in the first, did you get a, did you get a eight or nine or six or seven or three to five, whatever your number is, put it in. So let's see what your number is in the first dysfunction. Everybody write tight in. Let's kind of see where the group is. Okay, nines, love that. Four. Oh, LJ, you put them all the way across. Thanks, man. Okay, Rena is it eight, eight. Okay, so, all right. So if your number's eight or nine, the first dysfunction of absence of trust isn't a problem. If your number's three to five, 
it's an indication that that's a dysfunction that needs to be addressed. And so if you have three to five, if you're four in that, you should probably look at it. If you're six to seven, it means it may, it may not be a massive problem, but it's on its way to becoming a problem. So when you understand that that's a dysfunction, go back and read the five dysfunctions about that one. And we'll talk about how to solve that. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So now let's do dysfunction number two, fear of conflict. And so LJ, yours was seven in that one, right? And so yours was seven. I have sixes, sixes. This is a big one. There's an eight, there's a seven. So if you're a six or a seven, it indicates it could be a problem. So we should make sure that we're addressing it. If you're below a six or a seven, bigger problem. I see some nines on here. We're doing pretty good there. Okay, dysfunction three. So lack of commitment. Okay, so I'm gonna challenge you on this one. How many of your team members are doing a minimum of two transactions a month? And if they're not, why? If you're a full, if you're a full-time buyer's agent on a team and you're doing less than two deals a month, we have a problem. If all of your people are doing less than two deals a month, then there's a, I would say there's more of a commitment problem than you realize, not committed to their families, not committed to the process or the system, or you don't have one, or they're not committed to the consumer, which is it? And so rethink. And so LJ, as you write your numbers on here, and you and I are like, I'm talking to you as you're putting your comments in here. I appreciate you being interactive with me. He says, I've got only two, I've only got three team members and most of them are performing at less than two deals a month, right? So where is the issue? So we have to address that. And I would address it with commitment first. And you do that by understanding what their why is. I'm going to talk about these in some different slides. I'm going to keep going, but it's a fun, it's a fun exercise to find it and then find out what their level of commitment is. And then you can use that to help motivate and get their uh, performance up. There's no reason if you're full-time in real estate, you're not doing two deals a month. If you're not doing two deals a month, what the hell do you do all day? Because there's only two things we do in real estate. We prospect and we list and show houses. Everything else is fake work. And so you got to eliminate all the other crap. So we're focused on prospecting, showing your, showing your listing houses and everything else. Take it off their plate. Let them do the things that generate revenue. Okay, number four is avoidance of accountability. And that might come into the other one. And maybe they have a commitment, but there's no accountability and we're not tracking it. What are your numbers on those? Put your numbers in there. I see four. So four is a big, that's, that's a, that's, a, we have a problem. We needed to address it. Nine. I love that. Excellent, Rena. A couple of sixes, avoidance of accountability. So remember if you're six to seven, it means that dysfunction could be a problem. If you're below seven, it is a problem. If you're three to five, we really got to address it. And if you're eight or nine, then it's probably something that you're doing a good job with. And then number five, attention to result. Are we tracking the right things? And LG, I love that you put a four on this from the beginning. It was, it was the one that you wanted to focus on. And that's a great thing. We have some really cool tools for that that we use for focusing on the right numbers. And we're able to see it with dashboarding and things like that. I see an eight. I see a five. Tom, thank you for that. LJ, thanks for reposting that, Courtney. Any others? There's a lot more than three people here. So you got to put your numbers in there. Okay, so I've given you the test. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this. You have all this stuff. I used to give it to you as a download. So I just want you to know I'm going to give you access to this. So as I'm asking you, it's interesting and fun to go back and do the same things with how your team members believe and feel in the same thing. And so run this same quiz with your team members and then have a debrief and then talk about why you're disconnected and why you're scoring differently. And you'll find that there's opportunities for growth in every team. And so here's the solution. If you scored low in number one, Number one is team leaders need to know how to delegate. You have to realize as a team leader, when you, when you use the words, nobody can do it as good as me, I am going to challenge your ego because it's a bunch of crap. There's a lot of people that can do it as good as you. And there's probably people who would do it better. The only reason you do it as good as you do is because you've had different experiences of, the, of, of them that's caused you to do things differently. So you need to create those same experiences so people can do it as good as you. It's not that you're better. It's just that they haven't had the same experiences. Go back to that experience pyramid. There's three levels of delegation and you'll learn this. And this is kind of where, this is where I oftentimes struggle. Number one is complete super, supervision. That's when you say, here's what I want you to do. Here's exactly how I want it done. Now return and show me how you've done it. The second is partial supervision. Well, here's something that needs to be done. Uh, I'd really like you to figure it out, but give me, come back to me with what you think the solution is. I'll tell you whether or not to move ahead. The third one is, I trust you, just get it done. I oftentimes go to number three without taking the time to be clear in what the directions are. And Brittany, you're not allowed to respond to this. 
And so I'll go to complete independence. You can do, you can just do it. And I leave my people feeling frustrated because I haven't given them enough information yet. But once they've done it two or three times, then you give complete independence. And so as a delegator, we have to be better at giving people the tools and the information and the communication they need to be successful in their role. Okay, number two solutions, if you scored low in this one. For me, it's you need to know who's serving who as a leader. And this is a big one. If I'm serving, if, if I'm hiring people so they can serve me so I can have a better life, as a leader, your people will get tired of your attitude. But if you're hiring people so you can help them have great lives and you're serving them so they can live well, they will move heaven and earth to not let you down. So think about who serves who. Number three is we have to clearly define roles and clearly define goals and responsibilities. One of the downloads I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you a team and a way to, de to clearly define roles and responsibilities because it's awesome when you do it right, but it's way more intense than you think it is. What's your role? What's your goal? Is the team in line with those things? And what are the goals of your team members? Do you really know what they want and why they want it? And is your job as a leader helping them get those things? Uh, number four is understanding um, what drives our people. Anybody been watching Deion Sanders in Colorado, what he's doing with that college football program there? I, I was just in a conference with uh, the CEO of ESPN, who's here in Salt Lake today, and he was talking about the last two games of Colorado of like the biggest watched football games in history. They were number one and number two. How about that? And then they barely, they're not, they weren't even ranked barely. What is happening there is Dion has come in and he took 64 people on the team and he waved them and he went onto the trade wire and he brought a whole bunch of new people in. And then he's created a culture and he says, you have to answer three questions if you want to be on this team. And the first one is this, who are you playing for? I love that question. And if you can't answer that or articulate it, then he didn't give you a second interview. And so when he's looking for players, he wants people that are motivated for somebody other than themselves. I'm playing for my grandma. I'm playing for my dad who sacrificed or my mom who gave everything so I could get a get on a, a, a football team. Who are you playing for? What is your why? I love that. The second question is, do you have a passion for the game? And, and, and help me understand your passion for the game. And the third thing he asks is, are you willing to put in the sacrifice to be a champion? Man, if you ask your team members those questions, how do you think they would score? You got to understand who they're playing for, their distinct reasons and their whys. Number five is understanding behavioral styles. You can't treat everybody the same. You have to treat people the way they want to be treated. The golden rule says do unto others as they would as you would have them do unto you. I think the golden rule is actually false. That we should practice a platinum rule, which is a higher level that says do unto others as they would have you do unto them. It's not about you. And if you understand what they want and you help them learn in the way they like to learn, not the way you like to learn, they'll progress much faster and things will resonate with them long term. So the solution I'm going to tell you is that right now we have to focus on personal development. In order to make people better, we have to become better ourselves. Better agents are better people. And when you hire and develop great individuals, they become better agents because they always choose to do the right thing. And when you have people on your team that are choosing to do the right thing, it is game changing because they know we're all headed the same direction. Um, this is what uh, this is what it looks like when you're with a program or a company or a coach that understands your role as a leader that focuses on leadership development to help move you forward. And I'll tell you, Rhett, there is no there is no more important time than what's going on in today's marketplace for you to have a really good coach, whether it's workmen or somebody else. I just encourage you all to find someone that resonates with your values and that thinks like you do, that can teach you how to become the leader that will lead your team to the next stratosphere. You've got to learn how to empower and trust your people. And if they don't trust you and you can't empower them, you won't be able to grow. So I'm going to challenge you to study the materials. I'm going to give you a couple of links really quick. Before we move on, I want to make sure that SYNC has the opportunity to tell you about the program that they run called the Guaranteed Sell Program. And as they're doing that, I'm going to invite you to come to the greatest conference of all time. It's called Leverage, and it's coming up. It's October 26th to the 28th in Bonita Springs, Florida. And this is where team, teams come to come together. We have tracks for buyer's agents, listing agents. We have tracks for administrative assistants and tracks for team leaders where I bring in emotional intelligence experts. And I'm actually bringing in Matt Warner, who just retired as the commander for 
the SEAL team that you all know I'm going to say, but I, he, doesn't, he doesn't like me to say which one he was in charge of, but it was the best. Dr. Del Toro is about living your greatest life. Sherry Levitt talks about selling from the heart. She's one of LinkedIn's top 10 influencers in the world. And we have a whole bunch of other speakers that are experts in real estate, teams, conversion, and more. Sync's one of our premium partners at this event. And uh, we'll be sharing some new things that we're going to be doing together. So I encourage you to come to that. Tell me what Sync is doing. Give us a quick snapshot of what Sync is doing to uh, make it easy for people to engage. Yeah, so we're excited. We'll be at Leverage. We're excited for that as well. I'd encourage people who, who can take, take a look at that. Picking back off what Verl was talking about here in terms of the importance of having a system in place, right? And really just the system is going back and seeing what has led to success in the past and what were all those activities that led it there. So we've been doing online lead generation for a decade plus now in the real estate market with good and bad markets. And looking at tens of millions of leads and hundreds of thousands of closed deals, we did an analysis earlier this year. We looked at what are the things that successful agents and teams did to turn those online leads into closed deals. We built out a big sync success playbook. We share a very similar viewpoint to Verl as well. Like the system and sticking to the system will lead to success. We said, what are the activities and the habits that people were doing that led them to getting closed deals. And basically we said, hey, we're so confident that if you do the right things, you will see success. We are doing a guaranteed sales program. We'll, we will guarantee an ROI in the first year, or you will get, you'll essentially get the platform free until you get your return. We've got product experts to give you more detail about that. I included the link out there. But really at the end of the day, what we see is the biggest value there is having that playbook of like, how do you take online leads and use a system to turn them into closings? Thank you. And I, and I appreciate that. And just putting your money where your mouth is. Just, you know, when you have a guaranteed program, this is you're going to get an ROI. You just get into it and just do it. I want to give everybody access to my daily huddle agenda. We've got an, this is a Google spreadsheet on roles and responsibilities of every team member. And there's a whole work through that we go through with coaching clients, but I want to give you access to that. So use this QR code to download that. And then you'll get a copy of the, of the webinar as well. I encourage you to share this with people who you know could use some leadership help. Share the webinar with them and share it with others. I hope that you'll join us at Leverage and I hope that you'll give Sync an opportunity to show you why they are willing to do a guaranteed sell. I appreciate you being here and I wish you great success as leaders in our industry because we all need better ones. Thanks everybody. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Farrell.